Hey guys, I'm back again, finally. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have the next interview now and it's going to be an international one. So, um, yeah, I'm just waiting for... Um, um, I'm just waiting for uh, Fatahat to join because like this um, stream we're not going to do it via Skype, we're going to do it via um, Zoom. So yeah, it's 6 p.m. he will call me and then we'll start the question round. Um, we already listened a little to his music. I really love his style, like I think it's very uh, cool. So. I'm super excited to get to know him and see what kind of person he is, what inspires him, um, how he gets this cool ideas. Like, oh, I see. I can like. Now I can talk. <laughs> I just, I just managed to figure out Zoom. I think. Um, mm, I'm just gonna see. If this here makes sense, I still don't know. I do so many Zoom calls every week, but I've had it, I think, one time in my um, in my stream. Dub, dub. Now he, I think he's coming in now. <laughs> Let's see. Uh huh. There's something happening. He can't hear me though. <laughs> hey. Now I can hear him. Hey. Yeah. Once again, I have to click the thing, but now the window is gone. I don't know where the window is. <laughs> up here? Up here, yes. Um, there's a, a church in the background because it's six o'clock and they have some sort of thing going on. So I don't uh, know if you can hear yeah. the Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> nice to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little delayed, but that's okay. It's oh. it's perfect. I think uh, it's just perfect that you're here now, and I'm so happy to, you know, hear about your music and um, everything. So maybe we'll just start by saying who you are and what you're doing. All right. Uh, I am Faderhead. I'm a producer, music producer, singer from Hamburg in Germany, uh, and oh. I say singer in air quotes because. A lot of people would uh, debate that I'm an actual singer. Um, me too, actually. Yeah. And um, I kind of make dark electronic music. Um, mm -hmm. And I used to say it sounds like Paris Hilton is having sex with the Incredible Hulk. So it was very poppy and very like energetic. Uh -huh. But these days, I basically say it's a mixture of Daft Punk and Depeche Mode and maybe Rammstein or Nine Inch Nails or something. It's 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 a crazy sound for sure. So when did you like um, start getting into into that kind of music? Even because I feel like it's very unique. Like it's it's not mainstream. Uh, the thing is, I grew up with like when I was very little. I grew up with Michael Jackson and stuff like that. So that was very mainstream. And then um, my youth and I don't know twenties was mainly metal and playing guitar oh. and uh, everything else came later. Um, I basically started making electronic music because I didn't want to play in a band anymore because mm -hmm. then you have to, you know, the drummer doesn't show up for rehearsal. The bass player never practices. Um, <laughs> the singer, I don't know, his girlfriend <laughs> wants to go to the beach, so he can't make it. Um, I don't know, You tell someone has to do something and they don't do it. And I was very sick of that. so. Um, I liked it more to be able to put a laptop into your bag and go to, I don't know, Brazil and play with just a carry-on bag with like underwear in it and, and a laptop in, in your other bag. And then um, that's how um, I decided to make electronic music. And I don't know, it was kind of this weird mixture of making it kind of poppy, but also making it heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and since I couldn't sing, I really had to figure something out to make it work. Because if you if you think in your head that you want, oops, things. Uh... Now now it's okay again. Now it's okay again. Just keep on talking. Yeah, if you right. think in your head. If you think in your head that uh, um, you want to have something poppy, but you can't really sing, mm -hmm. so how are you going to do that? I don't know. It, it was just like this typical evolution where how it is all, always um, where, you, where you don't say, OK, I would like to be like Taylor Swift or something like that. 
But it was like, oh, I'll, I'll do this and then I'll do that and I'll make something and it sucks and I'll make something else and it's a little better. And over over time, it becomes a certain style. And this is, I don't know, dark electro, goth electro. I don't know what you want to call it. I love it for sure. I think it's very interesting. I really love your energy. Um, okay, so when did that all start? Like, h how old were you when you were starting making music and stuff? Did it start Whoa. with this, like, or did you do any kind of other styles before? Because you said no, you were uh, in a band and stuff. Yeah, um, I started playing guitar when I was 13. So that's like Ooh. 31 years ago. <laughs> wow. So it, it was 80, 88, 1988 or something, 1987. You started young for sure. Like, well, uh, I had nothing else to do back then. <laughs> <laughs> and where you like, where you like from the be beginning on sure that you want to do this like as a job? Yes. And actually, back then, I was more certain than I was not, than I'm now. What? What? Well, Why? If you're 13 and you you have a guitar and it's the best thing you ever seen in 13 <laughs> years of life, <laughs> and you read heavy metal magazines and it all looks so cool, but you live in a in a little village and nothing is as cool as the things <laughs> in the magazine, you kind of um, you you kind of. Uh, get the idea that it's it's a bit better to be a, a, a rock musician than it is to be, I don't know, uh, an engineer or something. Uh -huh. And back then, kids were really stupid. It, <laughs> that included me. Like, I was very stupid because you didn't have the internet. You didn't have, yeah. I think, you had more like five TV channels, like RTL television, <laughs> first, second, and whatever. It was five, five or ten TV stations, and that was it. So, wow. So I don't know. Um, it, it was very appealing to me to, um, you know, not become something normal. Yeah. And uh, gotcha. so I've done that ever since, basically. <laughs> with, with 10 years in between where I did something else. But, but I mean, why were you more sure in the beginning than you are now? Sorry, sorry, the, the, the sound was gone for a second. Why why? Uh, why were you more sure in the beginning than you are now? Because something did something change? Uh, yes. What? Uh, well, let, let me think. Um, the, the Faderhead thing has been quite successful for what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if I co go into a club in Florida that plays this kind of music, everyone knows who I am. Mm -hmm. If I go in a club in Hamburg that has nothing to do with this music, nobody knows who I am. So it's mm -hmm. like a it's like a nice mixture of of um, uh, having some success, but not being Robbie Williams or I don't know yeah. Post Malone. They come into the supermarket and they get hounded by uh, a <laughs> ton of people. So so I kind of got the feeling how it is to be on tour all the time, how it is to um, right all the time, how it is to have this kind of stress, that kind of stress, other kind of stress, whilst all the time not knowing if you can actually make enough money to be um, secure for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I always kept other jobs like photography or sports that's things that I that I did in between mm -hmm. because it allowed me to do in music whatever I wanted mm -hmm. so I, I had these two things I knew what it is like to be on on tour and be a full-time musician and I also knew that it's very very nice um, to have a certain income of a few yeah. thousand euros a month where you do not depend on the music mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the longer you do it the more you kind of get the idea that the music business is basically the same as working in a in a ah, normal job. You. So when I was 13, I didn't know that. I thought it was all fun and games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's I, why I think at 13, I was a lot more, a lot more into it than not into it, but like uh, naive than I am now. I think it's very interesting what you're saying there because it's uh, some of the reason why I started this channel here because I want uh, younger people especially to know what it's like to work in the music industry, you know? I don't want them to just look at a cover and be like, oh, it's so funny, 
because it's <laughs> not <laughs> like not that it's bad but there comes a lot of um you yeah. know effort that you have to put into it to get forward like you need to connect with people there's so much more to it than just making music and um, so i really understand your point there totally got Absol you. absolutely especially because it is um in general it is presented as if it was so easy yeah like if you hear an interview, usually someone would say, yeah, and then this guy just made a beat and I just sang on it. It became a huge hit. Yes. And that might be true. That might even be true. But it's not what happens 99.9% .9 of the time. That and, and also what comes next. What comes exactly. next? If you yeah. have had the success like this, you got to learn how to keep it. Like, that's also a big part of it, because sometimes I've been talking to people and they were like, oh, yeah, I want to be famous. I want to have this point and then everything is going to be all right. And I'm like, no, <laughs> everything <laughs> is going to be very uh, tough then, like mm, for sure. So totally got you there. OK, like how did your family react and friends when you told them, OK, this is this is what I want to do? What was their reaction like? Um. My parents at first, because I was 13 or 15 or something, they obviously said, yeah, yeah, let's the kid. He's he's finally doing something that he likes. You know, when you're eight and you do karate and then you're eight and a half and you do soccer and then you're nine and then you play the flute and then you're 10 and then you play chess. And, you know, your parents are like, oh, my God, when is he ever going to do something that he yeah. actually does for certain? So I played a lot of guitar like hours when I was a kid. So my parents were like, oh, cool. He found something that he likes that let him do that. Yeah. But it came, I don't know, when I was eight, 19 and I went to university and I was still doing the stuff much more than going to university. They kind of oh. got like, oh, what the fuck is he doing? Oh, can I curse here? I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you can. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, curse. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, as long and as you're not taking off your clothes and starting to do no, something, no, no, nobody, everything's nobody good. Wants to, nobody <laughs> no, wants no, to. no, but that's that's Twitch. Like you can, you can curse. Hmm. What right. would the gamers do if they couldn't, right? <laughs> that's true. Yes. Um, and I think the older I got, the more concerned they got, and oh. obviously did the like the '80s, '90s parents. Nothing will ever come of this because you did not have this today gamer is a professional job yeah where you can make a ton of money a youtuber or a twitch streamer is a job where you can easily make more money than regular people who who work in a bank it doesn't it doesn't mean that it it's easy to do it but it's not uncommon it's a job so, like you can earn money with it quote exactly but back then it wasn't and music wasn't either i mean people people have this idea especially older musicians and music industry people they have this idea that things were better back in the day yeah but they lot. really it was easier to make money if you were in a system like if you were on a major label you almost always made money not almost always made money but it was much easier to make money because yes. there wasn't that much competition yes but these days anyone could make money and I'm, no, I'm totally going off topic obviously no it's okay i love that that's what the like we do not have a time limit or something and i want to talk to people from the music industry and i think it's very interesting what you're saying there so keep on so basically back in the day it was like you needed a label and you needed i don't know a lot of contacts yeah. to start to even get into the game yeah so only a very tiny minority of the people even got to make things. I mean, back then, I remember I had a huge 32 channel mixing board in my basement that I bought for nine and a half thousand marks, which is oh. the equivalent to 10,000 euro now. Cool. And um, without that kind of stuff, you couldn't do anything, at least not in any way usable. Yeah. And today, I mean, uh, you can make music on your little thing and even sing on it yeah. and be OK. It can be totally, totally OK. And um, the same with all the Spotify and DistroKid distribution things. Um, so these days, it's 
I think as hard to make it as back in the day, but the entry level is easier. Yes. Because you don't need you don't need Universal Records anymore or whatever BMG whoever yeah. was was it back then to to get you from absolutely nothing. I have a guitar and an amp. Yeah. How do I make an album? Uh, you don't you don't have to you don't have that first step anymore. Yeah. And um, you're not relying time, on them. Exactly. That's a great thing. But at the same time, you have nobody that you can rely on. Yes. So, so you have to rely on yourself, which makes it quite hard. Hello. It's very, very. Uh, oh, now it works again. Yeah, but uh, it's very. Oh, no, it's better. <laughs> it was very. Uh, what do you call it? Blurry. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. But I totally like, yes, absolutely true what you're saying there. Uh, you have to rely on yourself and you never know like you might send something out it gets into the wrong hands then it's gone the success is there you're not earning anything from it well that's a, that's another thing that's another thing that's so another thing. so m did it must be crazy for you because you've been in the industry for quite a time to see the way that uh the business changes so how was that for you to see that like how what was it like did it surprise you <laughs> The, the thing the thing is um it wasn't as crazy for me as it was probably for others because when i started the faderhead thing i had a record deal which with an indie label which was a great label yeah. for the first two albums and then we we cut ties uh very amicably we're still friends and uh and everything's fine mm -hmm. but um I, at some point, I decided I, w I want to do my own label, and it was 2000, late 2007, mm -hmm. um, because I basically figured I can do all of that myself and not give up 80% of the profits. Yeah. And back then, there was no streaming and there was no MP3. There was, I mean, MP3s were there, but it was Napster. So you basically lost money from MP3s. The iTunes and Amazon MP3 did not exist or not exist in a good capacity. Mm -hmm. So it was still all CD and all these things. So I basically started doing that in 2007. So I had to, to learn how to do all the web stuff and how to do to distributors and how to talk to magazines and, and all these yeah. kind of things. So that I was a, a when you do all these things, mm -hmm. it becomes a very slow process because because you start when there's no iTunes and then there's iTunes and you learn how, how to do the iTunes thing, how to get your stuff on there. And then there's, I don't know, streaming, but nobody gives a shit about st streaming yet because the internet is too slow. So for me, it's been a, what is it now? 13 year process to do that. Yeah. Um, because it was like every year there was something new. So you have a six to 12 months to, to get used to it. It was kind of easy, um, not easy, but it was, it was gradual. Mm -hmm. And that made it not as bad as if I was a, a I don't know, a Sony executive. And all of a sudden I have only 10% income from CD sales in one year in 2007 and I get fired. <laughs> oh, so that's yes. Much harder if, if that was my reality or if I'm a band and I don't know, I don't have any CD sales anymore. Sucks, you know, and it, it wasn't as problematic as for me as it was for other people. But you made like the right decision. You were like, okay, there's something happening here. I gotta react. And I think that was the mistake that many people back then didn't do. They were like, oh, mm, it's all gonna go, go away, blah, blah, blah. And then they lost <laughs> their job, you know? And sometimes yeah. I even feel like it's a mistake that people do still do sometimes. Like, um, that, that, I feel like it's that a they part- they don't react or what is the mistake? No, no, think? yeah, that they don't react. They don't, they okay. try to ignore the process. Like, okay. I feel like I've been experiencing that too. Uh, did you ever have an experience where you just realized, okay, they're not getting it because they're just so fixed on their old thinking? I, I still see it today. Every, uh, like, um, we, we're, we're doing a thing now. Um, it randomly started when coronavirus started. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, my keyboard player and a very good friend Jörg started a Saturday DJ stream and um, he's done it every Saturday with his girlfriend. Um, I 
accidentally uh, was on the first stream, but it was just because I was in, in the uh -huh. been doing that. And it kind of has sparked a, a certain community around it. It's not like the best we ever had was, I think, 400 people watching. So it's not huge, but it was it was something. it was it's, not, it's something exactly. Yeah. And um, the the thing that happened is this kind of stuff started and then we bought it uh, brought a discord server around it and did all sorts of little things to go in a direction that it makes it easier for fans and people who are just interested in this kind of music to interact with the music mm -hmm. at the same time many of my friends who are signed to labels in in this uh let's say goth goth rock goth electro scene which yeah. is basically the scene i'm in they're still buying ads in print magazines oh, fuck. and and they are still i don't know putting flyers out um and which is fine you know you, i'm not saying you can't do that but that's all they do oh they don't know what facebook ads are or they don't know how to run uh instagram swipe story ads or stuff Ooh, like that still? And it, they don't and wow. it's like if I put, I don't know, a hundred posters in the city of Hamburg, like I'm not saying it's only a hundred, but at a hundred locations. Yeah. I, I can never reach as many people with these posters as I can with a targeted ad. No, and, you can't. <laughs> and, and, and that's the that's the thing. I see it every day. It's mostly older people, but older people are the are the ones who run the industry usually. Mm -hmm. Nobody who's twenty one runs their own label for a long and successful time obviously how yeah of course you you're young like but exactly. even if even if i feel like many people these days get into the industry more early if that makes any yeah. sense um yeah. still you're young and you can't have that experience to even yeah honestly to be able to run like a real real big uh, label i'm not saying that we people who are 21 uh, can't reach anything that's total bullshit like no, we've no, seen no, people no. reaching even younger people reaching so crazy uh stuff but i'm just saying the experience um that you need that's that's not possible in that age to know what a person that has been like in the business for 30 years knows of course but that doesn't have anything to do with success in my opinion But, and that, but that's kind of a problem because if mostly the people who are 49 and 51 run the stuff, yeah, um, they really have to trust the 21 year old to uh, deliver results on a, I don't know, on a 200 year <laughs> because if even if it works, they'll be like, oh, but I like print ads more, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a, like a visceral and a, like a, a, a heart thing for them. It's what they know for the last 25 to 30 years works and they don't use the phone as much as We everyone do. else yeah. because Facebook sucks and everything sucks and Instagram is just photos of themselves. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I don't know. It's it's a weird thing. And I really see this uh, to your question um i see this very often every day yeah got you same like would have surprised me if you didn't because but i also see lots of potential like developing out of that because the younger generation they are finding their ways you know like that is also what is happening at the moment they find their own ways they don't want to you know suck a dick to get this record deed uh record deed <laughs> <laughs> to be honest just to to name it like they don't Maybe want I, that you're you sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah m most of them i feel like most of the newer generation just wants uh to find solutions uh for problems and that's a positive thing i think we gotta go away you know sorry, sorry? i think we gonna like or the younger generation it's gonna go its way Yes, yes, definitely. In your in your opinion, mm -hmm. um, would you say what would you say is like the strength of the average twenty one to twenty twenty to twenty five year old um, musician 
right now? What do they do really well? Um, good question. <laughs> I love that. Because the um, ones I see, they're completely clueless. And I'm not saying everyone is, but the ones I see are, are completely clueless. So I'm interested in seeing what the strengths are of those who are not clueless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's a good point, because, of course, like I work as an A&R, I see both. I see both. Yes. I see some yes. people being super young and honestly super dumb because they don't have a clue from anything. They Sometimes I even have people coming to me with contracts. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like there are lines and like for the rest of your life, the music is going. <laughs> what the fuck? Like when in the, the universe? Yeah, in the universe. Right. <laughs> But I also see see other people like that are very young and very thinking, very strategic. Uh, how do you call it? Strategisch? Strategic. Yeah, they are thinking very strategic. So I have Like, just to name somebody, I um, just worked together with this girl. Her name is Alina Kani. Uh, okay. She was also here on the channel when she was uh, still very uh, small. Nobody knew her. And then she started doing TikTok. And within right. weeks, she just whew, went around the world, had like uh, over one million uh, clicks on her videos and really like, really had success on that platform and what she's doing now is she's uh, bringing out a merch with yes, the yes. thing that got her going viral so that's what I see a lot people are thinking differently people are trying out new things from that generation I also know a producer that is like he's creating a new new kind of music you know so I see lots of creativity happening there and also um, Yeah, it's very strategic thinking of some of them, not all of them, but some certain ones really have that. So that's what so, I so, see. So you say the out of the box kind of thinking is the strength? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm going to have, have another drink. Here <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but well, yeah. Wine, it's, it's warm so you can drink wine and water. That's a good thing. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, what also would really interest me because I feel like you have a very strong personality like I like I said in the beginning I like your energy so what is it what music means to you personally what is it what got you so hooked on it uh, that's a very long answer um, my my therapist said uh, you mainly love music so much because it is the one thing nobody around you understood so they couldn't fuck with it mm -hmm. so like if if your if your brother is better in school and your dad is better at sports and your mom is better at whatever um and you're a small kid you look for something that you're good at and nobody is better at that's mm -hmm. what my therapist said. i don't know <laughs> for me it's just uh for me it's just um The one thing that for the last yeah, 31 years, most days of the year, I really like doing. Wow. So, That's crazy. And I mean, um, my apartment is kind of a weird apartment because <laughs> if you look, I'm not, there's a, like, if you go into the, into the hallway, there's three picture frames. And all of my friends know that for the last 12 years, there's not one single picture in these frames because I can't be asked. I don't give a fuck to put a picture in there because I don't care. What? But that is this crazy. Room, the, the studio room is the nicest room except for my bedroom. So it's like, that's the one thing that I really, really care yeah. about doing and Even if it's, you know, of course, some days you don't want to see any anything music related or anything. Um, but these little things uh, signify that I don't give a fuck if there's like uh, a hole in the wall in the in the in the hallway. There is none. But if there was, I, I don't care. Got you. Yeah. But here, everything has to be nice and everything has to be in a way that it, it, it's conducive to making music. Uh -huh. And um, the amount of uh, happiness and and general satisfaction, life satisfaction, um, that I have from 
um, just sitting down and making music is immeasurable. It's huge. Yeah. And like every person, I've done so many things wrong in my life or, you know, fucked up so many things, uh, including music. But at some point, it was always possible for me to go here and make music and at least be happy with that. Gotcha, it doesn't yeah. matter how, how shitty the rest of the day went or what whatever else went wrong. I could at least be happy with that. And uh, I mean, what else do you want? Yes, That's it's like it's like a safe space. It's like a space where there is no real time. There is no real, you know, conversation like, you know, like we are having it now. It's It's different because music can reach you on so many levels. It's timeless, kind of. I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's funny that you say safe space because when I when I work with people in this room and they're new, mm -hmm. I tell mm -hmm. them, uh, in this room you can never make a mistake. Lovely. Which, which means it doesn't matter how terrible their idea is. And even if I say, oh, that's a terrible idea, yeah. uh, or how terrible my idea is, and they say that's a terrible idea, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make them a, a worse human or it doesn't make them, I don't know, a worse musician or something and at the same time uh, i should show you a video we, uh, like my friend danny and i when we produce i record it yeah. i have like the same camera that i'm on now i have running for six hours um oh. because you never know like sometimes you might want to cut this together into a 30 minute thing that's interesting on. um so the the point is if you listen to us the amount of criticism we give each other in these five hours it's like 90 percent of the time one of us is saying that's not good wow the other says that's not good enough this melody is really weak <laughs> it's, it's it's the opposite of safe you're taking it, out the ego right yes yes yeah and it's safe at the same time because Got you. I really got you. It's like if you see, I'm sure if you look on it on a like a psychiatrist basis, if you know what I mean, like if you yeah, try okay. to see the psychology behind it, um, I think that really makes sense because I think it's a big problem um, when it comes to criticism, actually, in the industry. Like it's very difficult for people to separate that, especially when you're an artist and you're producing with somebody new. It's super, it's super tough. And I feel like when you do that the way you do it, you take out this fear of being wrong and being okay with being wrong because you both want to find the right solution, right? 100%. But I also think that it only works if you, first of all, if everyone respects each other mm. there and, and not this fake respect that we have today where it's like, yeah. I don't know you, but I'm supposed to respect you. Yeah. You know, and you could be the, the most terrible songwriter in the world, but you know, I'm f fake supposed to respect you. That's not what I mean. I mean, like if, if Danny and I sit here, it doesn't matter what we say because we both respect each other's skills. Right. Yeah. And not uh, everyone knows. And yes. obviously, we're human beings who are polite. We're, I'm not going to say you fucking asshole, bitch ass, no <laughs> good. I don't know what. No I'm good. Say that. They, yeah. You know, but at the same time, um, it only works if that is the the general the, the general idea. Mm -hmm. um, if if that's not the way, then as a producer, you have to kind of make the other person. Um, I don't know at least make them feel like they came up with your idea. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's say we make music, whatever, um, for the first time, and I really don't like what you, the idea you just bring. So it's basically my job since we don't know each other and I don't know how sensitive you are or whatever. Um, it's my job for the next one hour to make you think that you had the idea that is actually my idea. Mm -hmm. because i don't like your idea so let me let me figure out how i do it so that gotcha. in the end yeah. we both like what we did but yeah. uh it was actually my idea and you think it was yours that's much harder but i mean that's that's really what uh and i'm not that kind of guy but that's what uh, distinguishes great producers from good producers from shitty producers and yes. i'm like in between good and shitty i'm not very good at the <laughs> at the making you think it's your idea while it's my idea. 
<laughs> yeah, but that's totally okay too. I mean, I can also see it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> the people here in the chat really love you. Um, really? I, I don't even see the chat. Wait. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's like um, one said, um, people blaming the industry for signing insanely stupid contracts valid forever. Contracts are my favorites. Endless source of... Uh, amusement that was when we were talking about the contract thing oh, and right, then right, someone right. was like uh, your ego is not your amigo <laughs> 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 that's that's also very cool and um, somebody Make even uh, knows you because they were like in your apartment i think uh because there was someone yeah they sure, they wrote it's true it's true um oh, no pictures, pictures no yeah, yeah just yeah, frames yeah, yeah. yeah cool cool to have you here guys but yeah i totally on, agree on what you're saying um yeah very interesting the way you do it have you ever because talking about respect have you ever had a situation where you were like okay i'm sorry we can't work together there's oh, no respect many times. Ma really? Ma many, really? many 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 times how do you manage that like how do you communicate communicate that it's it's a, a difficult question because most of my most of my career I was always drunk and high <laughs> and not very friendly. I love how honest you are, though. So, so it's like, uh, back then I just said, said, fuck. What? Fuck them. Uh, that's, these days I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but, oh. but it's kind of difficult to say how, how, like today I would obviously say, um, I don't think that works, but uh, I have these three producers that, um, are much better at what you want to get. Oh, that's okay. clever. Oh, yeah. yeah, you want to get this trap, heavy metal, uh, uh, trance sound. I think my friend, blah, 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 would be much better because, I don't know, I'm not that good at heavy metal, <laughs> whatever, you know. And then I would give you that address and tell him to call that guy. And you'd be like, yeah, cool, he's helping me out because he's not that good at heavy metal. I would do it now like that, but back then I didn't. Oh, okay. But I, I think it's awesome the way you reflect on yourself. Um, it's really, it's unique, actually, because I feel like many people in the industry are very, you know, it's difficult to be yourself and always reveal your feelings and everything. And I feel like you're just such a directly person. Were you always like that? Or did the music industry kind of get that out of you? Ooh. I think people back then would have said that I was always like that mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. reflecting. <laughs> without reflecting. So, so I, I was always very direct and I would tell people what I thought. So if you had a CD, a new CD and told me, oh, this is my new album and I'd listen to it and meet you again in a week in a bar, I'd be like, that's a really weak album. So I would, I would be honest, but I wouldn't be reflecting on if that was a good thing or not. Mm -hmm. So I think the older I get, the more constructive reflection happens, I think. I, don't um, know. Uh, I understand. I understand. OK. But I think I get what you mean. Like you get older, you start reflecting more, but the, the base is the same, right? I think, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I seriously I can't remember much until I was 25 or something. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, of course I do remember, but not not in how do you say um, not in in detail. So you, you only you only remember like certain milestones. You don't really remember how you talked to your friend in school in ninth grade or something. That's true. That's really true. Um, what I think is like um, when you think about the cliche of being a DJ or a producer, you know, drugs, sex, rock and roll kind of in the DJ scene. Uh, would you say that it's true? Like, is that cliche true? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the, 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 the thing is, I would say most most musicians only or uh, musicians and djs especially only make music for drugs sex and maybe a little bit fame but for many it, it's enough to be famous in their hometown famous you know mm. and i remember i was 
teaching guitar many years ago. Um, and my student, his name was Thomas. He said, uh, I have a friend. He also wants to uh, take guitar lessons. And this friend, but he only, <laughs> he only wants to learn it uh, so he can impress some girls. So he only wants to learn oh, some no. Nirvana songs or something. <laughs> And there's always these two different, different approaches. Thomas yeah. was the guy who would spend two hours learning scales and practicing his songs. And you, you can always tell if, if there's like a long term, how do you say, um, a long term career is the wrong, wrong word, but the possibility of for the music. Mm hmm. Um, because if they're not, then what else is there? Yeah. There's no money, at least not at first. It's very unlikely that it's someone who makes money with this. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but at first, I mean, sometimes you have to pay the DJ. If, yeah. if you're, if you get a, like a really shitty club owner, they make you pay the DJ. So, so there must be another motivation. And it's usually not that sick beat that, I don't know, um, uh, whatever techno producer made on their new record. I, I, was, I wasn't going to say David Guetta because that's too, too com commercial, but I just can't, can't remember now. <laughs> um, um, what the fuck is the name? It's the Township Rebellion. That was the one. Ah, oh, OK. Um, mm -hmm. um, what's my point? Oh, so <laughs> if there's, if you have to have skills and you have to put in a lot of time without making any money, you better get some drugs and some girls. Hmm? I mean, yeah. what else is there for most for most uh, people well, who get into it? Well, <laughs> true, true. It's like a big, big, big part of the business. And I always uh, love this question because uh, you see on the way that people react, like if they're being honest or not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I, I, I also think that Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Say, say what you want to say. Um, I also think that it's completely OK if you are, if you can manage it in a way. Um, that was, I felt that was always the case with um, me and my surroundings. Mm -hmm. Because everyone was older, like, I think, I didn't know anyone who was under 30 mm -hmm. um, who was doing lots of partying. And it was always, um, uh, sporadic weekend partying. So it, it would be, oh, let's all meet at this festival and we'll stay up for three days straight. And then for four weeks, nobody did anything. Mm -hmm. And then it was this other thing and we, did a like, I don't know, 36 hour thing. And then there wasn't anything for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was always people who had a life and they had families or jobs or whatever. And they wouldn't be in need of partying too hard every day or most of the days. Mm -hmm. And I think it's much easier to survive that with some sort of career in music and also with some health and sanity if you were 30 and older or maybe 28 and older than if you're 17 mm -hmm. and you, you're basically fucked up from 17 to 25 and everything's really weird um, because I think at some point you become more stable if you have family, if you have jobs that require you to be sober most of the time. Yeah, you have to like you. Yeah. Um, so I think I got lucky in that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, somebody's like writing. It's called being a responsible fuck up. That's kind of pretty <laughs> good on point, <laughs> if you, <laughs> right? Uh, because yeah, yeah, I feel like I feel like um, all in all, are you like uh, pro drugs or contra? Um, Do you have an opinion about that? It, it's. I think everything's cool if you if you know the problem. Oh, that's a lot of wine. Wait, um, <laughs> uh, I didn't want. Uh, oh, fuck it. Uh, fuck um, it. Now, now it's out, right? <laughs> yeah. 
let me sweeten that with some water for a second. Um, I used to be in the camp, like every everyone who, who parties a lot is in the camp of everything at least once. Yeah. And um, I see I didn't shave here. Okay, good. I have to fix that. <laughs> um, um, these days, I would say that for most people who um, who, uh, who partake, they should they should know that the the consequence is not what TV and movies show you. It's not like you do a line of coke and then you kill people and go crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but the consequence is very slow. And it's like this, on Monday, you're tired. On Tuesday, you have a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. On Wednesday, your colleague at work uh, says something and you freak out. And over months and years, it becomes like an underlying unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the much bigger problem um, with regular drug use. And that's what most people don't know. And I didn't know that either. So that's why from today's point of view, I couldn't say what I would say. In general, I would say I had some of the best times of my life. So I would probably say people should try it, but they should try in good settings in with good people and not like throw crazy LSD on crazy MDMA and then some ketamine on top while oh. they go to a 30,000 people rave where they know only three people who've gone into completely other directions. I mean, this this kind of stuff happens all the time. And that's just fucking stupid. Yeah. Not saying I wasn't stupid, but it's not a good idea. People should know better at these points. Yeah, totally. And I think I really agree on that point uh, because I feel like drugs aren't like bad all in all, like not just bad. Of course, it can quickly get pretty bad uh, when you're not um, taking care of the things that you just named. But also, I personally feel like specific drugs really can be useful too. What do you think about that? Oh, sorry. I, I just, um, the, the, the Zoom, uh, the Zoom audio is faster, obviously, than the than the video. Yeah. And I was thinking, I, I, I saw your mouth move. <laughs> I was thinking, damn, I can't hear what she's saying. Um, uh, so the question was, what do I think about di different types of drugs? Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like saying that I personally think that uh, drugs can get very problematic super quickly if um, you yeah. don't take care of the things that you just named. But yeah that it can also, if you do it like in a responsible way, can you, uh, be useful, in my opinion. And I Absolutely. would love to know your op opinion about it because I have many people on the stream and I always got to take care who I'm talking to about this topic because you never know how people react. It's a very, like, very harsh topic, but I feel like you're a person that I could ask. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, I, 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 whenever I go out, which these days isn't that much anymore. But like to, after this, I'm going to go to a barbecue and then maybe meet some other friends later. Beautiful. So I'll, I'll turn on the computer here in the studio and I put the, the audio software on and everything's on because many times I come home at two, three, four in the morning and I have an idea. And I've had the idea for like the whole way home in the cab. Really? So if, if I then have to power everything up and then have to drag my kick drum into the template that will be shit so i turn everything on and um i really i don't think uh, i think i have written maybe a hundred songs like that um and there have even been songs when i came home completely smashed and the next morning on the back side of of my tax thing i had written the lyrics and i oh. couldn't even remember there's a song called Electro Sluts Extraordinaire. It's a very old song. I had written the lyrics on the back of my tax thing, and I didn't remember writing them. So obviously the alcohol helped me yeah. in some way that I don't remember write that song, at least lyrically. And um, if you can get it done in a way that works without too much damage, I don't, I don't think it's a bad idea. 
Yeah, yeah, got you, totally. Yes, it's always about responsibility, right? No matter what you do, if you don't think, it can turn out bad. <laughs> okay, this is becoming too unrocking. <laughs> At the same time, uh, in your large qu quantities, <laughs> as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, same. I just saw a manager, Arman, is here. Shout out to him. He's a very good, good. Yeah, I would also say friend. Um, so mm -hmm. cool that you're here, Armin. Okay, I would move on to the next question, though. So sure, could course. you could you ever imagine to work in a completely different different business? Like you named that you were doing like photo uh, photography, right, and stuff. Yeah. But that's also like, in my opinion, a little bit a part of creativity and stuff. But could you imagine doing something completely different? I actually do and did um, when. I don't know how old I was, 24 or something like that. Um, my mom said, uh, it was a smart thing. She's, you only think 10 years later that your parents have smart, or they had actually a smart idea. And she said something like, um, apparently you don't like the university too much. You should really learn anything else so that you can um, make money if uh, the music career doesn't work out, so you don't have to sit in Mönkebergstrasse, which is the shopping main shopping street in Hamburg, and oh, um, shit. and and play guitar for your rent. Yeah. And through I don't know, it doesn't matter. Through certain through through a friend, um, I found a two-year education, which is called fitness management, which is sports with uh, economics. Oh. And. I, I started this and I really, really, really loved it and immediately um, basically got a job running a big spa in Hamburg afterwards. And that uh, that went on for four years, two different companies. But it was a huge, huge job, like 60, 80 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And so I know the exact opposite side. And um, Luckily, at the same time, the photography started and the second, this Faderhead music started on the side. So at some point I made more money making, taking photos than I did in my 60 hour job. So I quit the, the, uh, the real work. Yeah. But, but that was basically running, running uh, 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 gyms with 20 to 200 employees, wow. making sure everything works, making sure the customers like the gym members got what they wanted, making sure the that was the shitty part. You have to make sure what the gym members get what they want. You have to make sure the management, the top management of the chain gets what they want. Yeah, basically and you basically Yeah, you're basically fucked. And you're it's like uh, and your, your your trainers have to sort shit out too. So you're in the middle of three people who want opposite things. It's the stressful. Trainers want to work work for more money, work less for more money. The, the customers want to get more for less money and the company wants everyone to pay them more money or pay the trainers less. So you're in the middle trying to get three people, uh, three groups of people to sort that out. And it's uh, it's not, a, not no, an easy thing. No. Would you say that uh, working in the music business is more stressful than working in another one like that, for example? What is more stressful? Um, I would say working in the music business is more stressful. Because? Um, because most people in the music business are really weird and very unreliable. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, uh, I have this, I have this uh, weird suspicion, just like me, who, who didn't want to do anything else. Uh, people end up in, in a, at a label because they didn't want to work in a bank or they sucked at the economics uh, studies at university, or they didn't want to become a doctor or something like that. So in general, um, everyone's trying to do their thing, but mostly they're not very good at it. And if they were like really organized um, Excel sheet, spreadsheet people, they would work at a consulting agency or in a ad agency or something like that. But they work in the music business. They work with drunk musicians who don't know what time it is. Uh, they work with management who are where the ego of the manager is bigger than the ego of the singer. Then they work with promoters who are so underpaid that they ask for a raise 
or they throw their stuff in the in the, in the garbage and it's like it's like a bunch of it's like a big clusterfuck of unreliability most of the time but and then you have the totally uh, opposed um how do you say uh, uh, opposite incentives. or do you, what do you mean yeah, the, 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 the incentives let's say you're the band yeah and you want to make you want to make a tour and have and have it make sense right mm -hmm. at the same time you want to make money enough on that tour that it also makes sense but your booker your booker just wants you to play as many shows as possible because he gets the commission it doesn't matter mm -hmm. so you play on friday in munich on saturday you play in i don't know denmark and on sunday you play in prague yeah. so you have Yeah, you go from Hamburg to Munich to, to Denmark to Prague back to Hamburg just because the, the, the booking agent made 200 euros more. And Fuck off, right? If you fly, it's okay, but I've seen these routings with people sitting in like a nine people van with 10 people. <laughs> And it's like, um, I already forget the question again. <laughs> oh, what's harder? What's harder? And yeah, it's a different type of hard. Yeah. It, it, Because I, I have the feeling that people in the music business are much more unreasonable than people in regular life. Yes, I and, totally yeah. agree. And if you can deal with that, then the music business is more easy. But I can't deal with that. I, I need structure. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I feel like you also mentioned that there's some pretty weird people also going around in that business. Like you said, it's a big problem that you can't rely on many. Yeah. I'm like, and what I feel like is the solution is really to find your people and you got to go through shit. I feel like that's also a big part in the music industry that many people don't think about when they, they are like, oh, I want to start working there. It's so fun. It's so cool. No. Ooh, you gotta go through a lot of shit to even realize and recognize who you want to work with it in the future. Like that is so important. I think even one of the most important things in the music industry is your mindset. You gotta know what you want. Absolutely. And and you don't have to take the first thing that comes along. Right. Which happens many times. Such a good point that you're saying there. Such a good point. Can only understand this if you had enough experience with the first and second and third offer being shit but yeah. you, you don't know that until you had the shit you know That's... um what was the from there i recently posted on instagram i posted a story with a meme and i think it was frank sinatra or some old star with a drink and uh i think the the, the line was um making good decisions comes from having experience and experience comes from having making bad decisions <laughs> so it's it, it's it's very true it's very true it, 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 I, i don't i don't see how anyone who doesn't fall for a lot of shit can constantly make good decisions you have to be probably very smart or at least smarter than me which is not hard nah nah don't make nah. yourself nah don't make no, yourself no. Too, too small no no no, no. I, you know I'm, i'm just you know i'm just saying i'm not the smartest guy in the world so there might be other people who make much better decisions when they're 12 than I make now. I don't know. I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah, right. You're being very reflectionate. I mean, that's that's good. And I love that. So um, the thing is, I totally agree. Um, would you say that you have been going through a lot of shit to get to the point where you're at now? Like, was it like that? I would say I would say yes, when like in the first 15, 15 years, maybe more than later. Um, like all the things I said earlier, like the drummer didn't show up. Uh, I was kicked out of my own band. What? Although I was the, the songwriter, What? I was the booker. No. I was the guy who designed the cover. I, I basically did everything in that band. And because I wanted to change the, I don't care. But you know, you get kicked out of your own band even though you are kind of the band, everyone else is just playing. And, uh, and, and during that time, there was a lot of shit. There was a lot of shit. And later, because there was so much shit the first 10, 15 years, and, and so that really helped. I also worked 
for uh, music magazines in the 90s and had my own little web magazine. So um, seeing what other people did uh, on top of my little stuff on the side, that was a lot of like a lot of teaching for later. Mm. And I would say during the, the Faderhead time, which was 2006 to now, it's been very good. Like obviously a lot of shit went went down and didn't didn't work out as well but it was pretty pretty good because i had 15 whatever 15 years experience before where everything went to shit gotcha. so i this, don't know it's this makes so sense yeah really like and i'm happy for you that you you kind of found your way to figure it out because i feel like many people break on it and just step out and run away or something because it's difficult to you know, keep your mindset when you're going through so much. I really think it has to do with this, with this. You back then, I uh, like back in the day, I said, I, I don't know anything else. I can't do anything else but music because I don't want to do anything else. And I don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. These days, I can't say that anymore because I know other things. But if I have the choice and I was presented with this choice yesterday, to do something else or to make music really on, on yesterday's day I, yeah i could i could I, i could make an ad copy which would have taken me about three hours for something for another project that i'm working on which is not music related mm -hmm. or i could sit down and i don't know what i did something music related obviously i did the music related thing. Mm -hmm. so it, that's the reason why i'm very good with whatever comes up And also, as you said, you said this, I don't know, 10, 10 minutes ago, that you have to pick who you work with. Mm -hmm. And um, if one of the people, I would have the same guys in my band for the last 11 years. Mm -hmm. Because I just spent a few years at first, but then really knew what I wanted, not only on stage skill wise, but also Uh, person personality wise and um, some of them I don't see often I only see them at the gigs but it's if, if you can sit in a car for 40 hours with someone and be happy all the time it doesn't get much better mm -hmm. but you're only happy if they're on the same uh, we say level. mental mental level when it comes to reliability, when it comes to responsibility, when it comes to their skill and all these things. And um, from the first 15 years, on the second 15 years, I basically decided I'm not going to work with anyone anymore who does not fit 100%. Yeah. And I, need, I mean, my best friend is in my band now. So and he's been for 10 years or nine years. So it's 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 a thing that I agree 100% with what you said. If you know what you don't want or what you want, it becomes much easier than if you just go for the result. Yeah. Like the, I want to be a famous rock guitar player. That's not a good goal to have. No. Very good answer. Very good answer. Really, I enjoy it so much to talk to you, actually. Um, the thing is, what I also wonder is when it comes to you, and your music um what are, do you have any goals in the future like where do you want to go in the future with your music uh you know i really think that the, the, the style of music that i'm doing is very very niche there's a very small amount of people in the world who listen to this luckily most of them are in germany <laughs> so <laughs> for me that makes it easier um and it's 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 not even funny like the biggest north american festival is about as big as the hamburg club yeah it's like yeah it, it's it's crazy how for some reason everyone except except 50,000 people who are spread all over the world everyone else is in germany so I really can't say with 100% certainty with my music because I see 
that recently um, it, it goes more towards producing for other people, like um, songwriting and producing for other other people, which I didn't do much in the last 15 years. I mean, I did, but not not happily. Okay. So, uh, well, when I started, I, I, I quickly got into Warner Chapel Publishing, and um, I wrote a bunch of stuff like for Backstreet Boys, Christina Stürmer, all the all the bands who were like kind of hip back in the Hello. 2000. And it basically was a lot of work for not a lot of result in the end. Really. And so I, I kind of decided I don't want to work for other people as a songwriter, um, but that has changed again with much more. Um, direct results right now. So that's probably a, a direction I want to go in for now. With my own stuff, I'll just keep doing what I do. It's, awesome. um, it'll evolve. Like every record is, is a bit different because the only thing that ties it together is my voice. Like if I make a trap beat and I do put my very typical voice over it, it sounds like a fader head track. If I do like an acid house beat, do my voiceover, it sounds like a fader head track. Because in the first three albums, I was all over the place. Like every, not every song, but five, six, seven different styles, which made it hard to market, very hard to market. It was from a marketing point, it was a shitty idea. Mm -hmm. I know that now. Mm -hmm. From a commercial point, shitty idea. From an artistic point, it was a great idea because now it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Now I can do whatever did the same thing already. Yeah. You, you just didn't listen, you know? So from an artistic integrity point, it's a good thing. Um, from a marketing point, I don't know if I would advise this to someone who would ask me to do mm -hmm. that, that if they should do it or not. Jesus, mm -hmm. the wine is working. Sorry. Do I still make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it does make sense indeed. Like, I, I got you. I got All you. Right. So you're, you're going... Uh, just also with the flow, I guess, right? You. Uh, yeah, but because you know, I'm I'm everything. I'm my label. I'm my marketing agency. I have a booking agency, but I mean, I did my booking for five years, or three years, or four. Or so I could do my own booking. I mm -hmm. just choose not to do it because it's become enough uh, effort so that I, I'd rather have someone else do it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what I do. If I take a five year uh, break, I can just start again. Or if uh, tomorrow I want to make like a Cypress Hill uh, cover album, I can do that too. Nobody will listen to it, but you know. Yeah, you're free. I know. I'm free, exactly. So I can't really tell you what's going to happen in the future, but it's. But you're going to be there. You're going to be, gonna be there. there. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. For sure. Okay, good. Um, what I really would like to know also is how do you manage uh, your private life uh, together with the music stuff? Like, how do you do, you do that? Because I know it's difficult. Or well, wouldn't what, what, you say that it's difficult? Uh, can you specify what you mean by private life? Yeah, I mean, like, for example, uh, stuff like family, relationship, because it's like a, a job that takes a lot of time, right? And you're not always um, available. So how do you manage that? Or are you always available? I don't know how you do it. So you'd have to, to ask <laughs> my girlfriends in the last 15 years. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm not that close with my parents. Uh, I mean, I see them a few times a year but not like they, they don't live near me. So it's not like I have to go there every weekend or some, some stuff like that. Um, I train my mom uh, via uh, like Zoom on the phone because ah. she had she had some back problems and there's no, no good physiotherapists in the little city they live in. So we just started doing it over the phone. Um, but that's only like, you know, very small amounts of time, like maybe 40 minutes or something. Um, other than that, when when I think back, one thing I always said to my girlfriends was like, if there's a release coming up, please be aware that any weirdness on my part has nothing to do with you. It's just that for the next, I don't know, if it's an album for the next eight weeks or if it's a single for the next two weeks or something, 
I really want to focus on this. And you're very welcome to be here or whatever, but don't be weirded out if that's the thing I think about most of the time. And don't be weirded out if whatever, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a good example right now, but this is what happens for the next two months. And if they can't handle that, they're probably not my girlfriend. Actually, somebody is uh, writing something in the chat that I think oh, is um, super, super true. He's uh, writing like people are working 40 plus hours per week on bullshit business travel on top commute. No one is available. Um, unemployment brings true free uh, freedom and availability. He's What do you think about that? Uh, for some reason, I can't read it like my chat doesn't. It doesn't matter, but um, I really think it's a blessing. It's it's true, but you don't want to be available all the time. Yeah. Let's let's say let's say you're my girlfriend. I'm your boyfriend. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Do I really want to see you 15 hours a day? Fuck no. Do you really want to see me 15 hours a day? Under no circumstances. So, you know, I if if. I date someone and she's on her phone the second I go to the bathroom or the second I go to the bar to get up new drinks. Bad sign. Mm -hmm. Bad, bad, bad sign. Um, because, I mean, come on, if, if, if you have to reply to someone within one hour or one minute, Ooh. that's a bad sign. That yeah. person has some issues. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying I or everyone else doesn't have other issues but that's an issue i don't know I, i used to date um for like two years year and a half uh the press secretary for deutsche bahn and oh. um so so we were like completely opposite in in life situations She interesting was working... combination for sure yeah uh, it was great i mean great great lady perfect mm -hmm. uh just She was working a lot. I wasn't working at all. Like, and she, we had this joke that I would just uh, become the housewife. No. Man, I don't know what you call it. A stay at home husband or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, my point being, what was my point? Oh, she was, she was so envious of the fact that I was actually very available and very, I don't know, not tied into bullshit from the managing partner of blah, 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 uh, distribution, who just wanted this because this other person wanted that. Yeah. So to your question, probably easier for most women who can deal with the fact that they, they are yeah. other women. And by that, I mean, that when it's a concert, you stand there for like two hours and sign shit and take pictures with a lot of women. Mm -hmm. Or you get weird emails from weird women. Oh, really? Have you I, experienced that? Oh, no, I've never experienced that. <laughs> no. Yes, of course. Like, uh, and the, the thing is, if, 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 if the, the person I'm dating is not cool with that, then I mean, what the fuck there, there's been so many situations when I'm, i'm filling my glass sorry um, easy cheers cheers um there's been so many like I, i'm just thinking of a situation with an ex-girlfriend of mine um <laughs> we were at a club and uh, at some point she came to me my girlfriend and said you know i just met this chick and she said uh i don't know last month um No. Okay, I have to explain that my girlfriend then lived in Hanover and I lived here. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see each other during the week usually. Mm -hmm. So apparently some chick came to my girlfriend and said, do you, do you know that Sammy fucked me that weekend? What? And she's like, really? He was in Hanover with me. What the fuck's wrong with you? Which is true. And But this kind of stuff happens all the time. Like all the time. What and the if fuck? I, I have like a little list when there's a like a, a relationship situation starting. I sit people down with that kind of uh, 
you know, you, if there's a release, I might be weird for a while. You do? If, if, if people uh, tell you I fucked them last week and please check where I was. It's not a long list, but it's a list. And if the if the lady is not able to deal with it, it's definitely the wrong person from the start. Totally. Because it's just part of the part of the thing. Totally. But honestly, like I'm I'm really shook about these women behaving like that. You you've been re receiving emails, emails. Yes, yes. I mean, that's that was the easiest way to that was before mostly before social media. But on social media, no, you don't see if if I read your DM mm -hmm. unless unless like we've exchanged DMs. So you see if I read it. But mm -hmm. if, if you if you don't know me, you, you email me, DM me. It just goes to some, I don't know, requests mm -hmm. thing and you can't see if I read it. Mm -hmm. So it's not as prominent anymore because I can just screenshot it, send it to my buddies and be like, look, it's another freak. <laughs> But um, back then it was just the only way was the contact form on your website, 2008 or something, or oh, yeah, Facebook Messenger also, whatever. Uh, easy, but but what would interest me also is, did you ever have uh, someone who was stalking you or something? Oh, uh, not really. Because, um, I mean, I, I <laughs> yes, 2007, actually, um, some girls tried to break into the apartment. What? Uh, I, wh while I wasn't there, I don't know. Um, uh, my neighbors told me, I don't even know if it's related to Faderhead or if they were just trying to break in. But um, at some point, my neighbor said, it was an old lady at the time, that uh, she heard like lots of noise at the door and came out and looked and there were like two girls dressed in black, which is very typical for the goth scene, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, with a card and like by, I don't know, how, I don't know how they tried to actually open the door, but you know, the, the general trick is to use like a credit card or whatever, uh, tried to open the door. Mm -hmm for me there was a very old lady living into the in this place and she had like massive door reinforcements because she was so scared of people breaking oh, into no. the apartment or whatever and so it's it, like even the, a, a key service has a hard time opening this door oh. so my neighbor just said you know uh you shouldn't be here i'm gonna call the police so the girl stalking or whatever it was but it's for sure a weird story it gosh was, it, was, it was weird yes it was weird. i didn't see it though ah Okay, which is maybe good because not you don't know, right? What kind of people? But the, but that the thing is, the thing is, I'm like I don't know. Without hair, I'm 185, 100 kilos. With hair, I'm like this is very short right now. I'm growing it again. I'm like 195, 100 kilos. <gasps> so you can is take care. Yeah, that's the point. I'm not very easily stalked and <laughs> intimidated because. It's, you know, yeah, it's, it's not, I... they're not that difficult, dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, okay, totally. Yeah, true. Okay. Um, what was uh, one of your most beautiful experiences that you had with music? Oh, I can say this with absolute certainty. Really? Um, yes. And it was, I don't know exactly when it was. It was a rehearsal with my first band. And it was actually only the drummer and me. And I remember playing something and being insanely happy about everything. As in like, the drums were perfect, the guitar sound was perfect, and I saw some weird color around everything. Really? And, and I remember smiling for, um, for minutes. I remember this very vividly. I don't remember much from that time, but I remember this very vividly. And the same thing happened in a club called Das Bett, in Frankfurt, I think, on the 2018 tour. And I even told this story because and the, the sound guy, which was the local sound guy, it wasn't my crew. Uh, he, he, at some point in one song, he put some delay on something. And back then I wasn't using in-ears or, or maybe I would have taken them out. Mm -hmm. And it sounded so good and everything was so on point 
And I also saw a little color again that wasn't like a, a light, you know, stage light or something. And it was the same kind of weird transcendent experience that I had maybe in 1997 or something. What the when I was playing fuck? guitar with my, my friend. And so that's, that's what I can very certainly say. Everything else would be many things. Like many, many things. Like we've played so many very cool shows. Oh, and and in October we played the release show for the last album, which was fucking nuts. It was the best show I've ever played, the best audience I've ever had. So that would be number three. Wow, beautiful. But that with the color is fucking. That, that is weird. Yes, it's really weird. And can you like wait, honestly were you on something or was it just No 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 nothing absolutely no I was in, in Frankfurt I was actually sick I was like the whole tour was in February or something and I was having a cold and that was the last show of the tour and I funny last week or two weeks ago I even got a message from someone saying oh by the way thank you for playing the Frankfurt show even though we were sick so I was absolutely, maybe I was on aspirin or something like that, but nothing. No, not no, nothing no, that doesn't explain it in my opinion. No, 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 no. Like, I, I, I think it's one of these weird things where where people get like religious about and or I don't know. But uh, that's, I can tell you these three things for, for certain because they're in my mind. Yeah, of course, it's beautiful experiences, but honestly, like I'm just hooked on that fat fact that you just told because it sounds so interesting like did you ever experience something strange in an other situation that was a little <laughs> like where you were like what well <laughs> let's do a different question <laughs> really there's so many strange things i can't even start i mean yeah, let's 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 talk about something else. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can move on if you want to. Like yeah, you certain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Many many weird things. Okay, easy. Okay. Um <laughs> Yeah? You sure? <laughs> yes, I'm absolutely sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um good. How did you what advice would you give somebody who would come up to you and be like, hey, I want to do what you do? Sorry, the, the, the audio was broken. What advice? Would you give somebody who would come up to you and be like, hey, I want to do what you're doing? I would tell them that they have to be certain that That it's what they want to do and i know it's very hard to be certain about that but if you if you think like i i tried drawing and i tried this and i tried that and i usually give up after a week or two mm -hmm. because i instantly recognize that it's not what i want to do mm -hmm. so i just stop that, and that's fine you know it's, it's that it's trying something so i i would first tell them they have to understand that it's really what they want to do and um, the second thing is that they have to learn all the skills that surround everything. So, as I said, I can do my own booking. I, I shot a lot of my music videos myself. Mm -hmm. These days, I take most of my promo photography myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very good with like spreadsheets and negotiation and all these kind of things because I know all the things. Mm -hmm. If a booker tells me something about a door deal with this and that and whatnot, um, they want to tack on a merch fee. I can discuss it with them because maybe I've been uh, in this club already and I know that the merch fee is not good. I don't know. Yeah. It's not, not what they usually do. I don't know. But, um, you know, these types of things really, really, really help so that at the end of the day, you get about 50% of what you want. Yes. So I, I really think most artists, when when they don't know all these things, they want to do one thing, and at the end, they get about 10% of what they want. Hmm. Because 100 other people take their part first hmm. and put their stuff in first or second, and then 
they want to go that way, but they really end up over here. Yeah, yeah. And if you know everything, and you don't have to be perfect at it, but okay, here's a story. Some guy I, uh, from, I don't know, Indonesia, mm -hmm. he was making really cool black metal artwork on Instagram. And I followed him and I thought, I want to hire this guy for, uh, for a t-shirt design. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I talk about what I want, like in a huge DM, because it's the only thing on Instagram that I have as a contact. And I get something back with a question. I'm like, I just wrote everything up top. And he replies, oh, I didn't read that. So I wrote it again in small, short thing. And he sends me something a day later. We agree on everything. It's all fine. And I'm like, OK, I want changes. And because I know what a designer needs, I send him a screenshot with like arrows. Put yeah. this here, put that there. And then he actually says, oh, so you mean I have to redo everything from scratch? And then I wrote, come on, dude, you're just placing shit in Illustrator and you're just moving it. This is a five minute job. Oh, OK. And he, what? Was, he, he was ready to charge me the double of the price because I want to change. But since I know how these things work and I don't uh, I'm not fooled by him saying, oh, I now have to sit every, like for six hours and draw it by hand. Um, the next day I had the design that I wanted. And it was it looked really good. In the end, I changed another 20 percent, like to, to make the type fit, because I know how to do Photoshop and Illustrator. I could do it on myself without having to deal with some guy who didn't want to do the work at the other end of the world. Hmm. So um, if you know all these things, everything will be easier. Yes, it's not going to be easy at all, but it will be much, much easier because nobody can actually fuck with you in 100 percent. They can fuck with you 20, 30, 50 percent, but not take everything from you well, and make everything harder. I, and that would be my main advice. That's such a good advice, honestly, because um, it's so important to know the different perspectives and so important to take care, like very, very, very good advice. So you would say uh, try to understand, right? Try to understand yeah, the different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and actually learn, yeah. learn this. Like my last album cover, my friend Phil and I did it together. I mean, he did all the work. Mm -hmm. But we did, what do you call it, uh, some screen share software. So I sat in my bed with beer while he was on his computer doing all the Photoshop. And I would just say, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? And both him and his girlfriend later said, man, I wish all our clients would be like that. Mm. Because I could say, oh, use a different blend mode or, you know, little technical things that even though n neither him nor I knew what the end result was supposed to be. It wasn't like, oh, I want this. It was just, let's try it. Mm -hmm. But because I know the program a little bit and I know how a designer sometimes thinks, it makes it also easier to work with other people, especially if they're really good. They don't want to deal with fuckheads who don't know what the fuck they're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you make it easier on yourself and also because for you them... make it easier for the other person. Right. Yes. So yeah. you get better results. And that's what I really would suggest this be in it for like 100%. That's what you want to do and learn everything, even a little bit. Awesome. Oh, I'm getting really drunk. Sorry. Super yeah. easy. No problem. I don't have like, I just have three questions left for you oh. that I really want to know because um, yeah. my next question would be, how do you think the music industry will develop in the future? Any ideas? Um, I think uh, live music is going to make a huge, huge comeback um, simply because it'll take longer than everyone, ex including me, um, expected for it to start again. Mm -hmm. So people will be really happy. Like, I really think there's going to be a, 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 like a big uptick in that for those that survive. A lot of people will have gone away because they couldn't manage the year or whatever without um, like bands, bands and clubs and whatever. But those that survived will see like a big spike. Um, I also think that even more is going to happen in the in the online. Um, how, how do you say this? 
I don't, I'm not saying online performance because I think I think that is mostly shit. Most live gigs online are really lame. Mm. Um, but I, I'm I'm talking about everything surrounding uh, the band or the the artist. Everything that that is online will be much stronger. Mm. Um, simply because people will now have one year or like nine months of bands either adjusting to not playing or not. So mm -hmm. if you're a band and you don't have, I don't know, a Discord chat and you don't have uh, interviews like that happening or you don't have whatever, like a lot of avenues to reach people, then you'll be kind of fucked um, simply because people will forget you because there's no magazines and there's no live shows. And after years, like, oh, they still exist. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think there's like, going to be a lot of movement towards surrounding things online. And for more commercial genres than mine, it'll be very, very like um, uh, sync licensing, and which means like music for advertisements and movie trailers and all that stuff, and uh, uh, brand collabs. Like if you can get a small brand to give you 500 bucks for this, or if you can get Gucci to pay you, I don't know what, whatever it is, depending on your demographic and on your style and how many, how much audience you have, I think it's going to be a, a lot like that. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend who's a, a songwriter uh, who does a lot of country, country stuff in the US. And he said every, like, the country has a lot of storytelling lyrics. So back in the 80s, they would say, I was driving my old pickup truck with my dog and my wife had left me. Now they would say, I was driving my Dodge Ram 1500 because Dodge paid Taylor Swift. It's not country anymore, but who, who the fuck? Got you. Uh, country artists, famous country artists, they pay them X amount of money for, for the 2 million uh, streams per week to have the name Dodge Ram 1500 in there. And it's even more, actually, it makes the song even more specific. Mm -hmm. Because everyone, it, it doesn't mean it's the favorite truck of everyone, but in your head, you think, oh, Anya is driving her Dodge Ram 1500 with her dog, whatever name it is. And you have an image. Yes. And it, it works. It's not obtrusive. It's not like a massive ad in the front of the song. Boy, the new. And I think this kind of stuff for artists who are big enough will work really well. Very good answer. I actually uh, plan, it's a thing more in the future, but I plan on making a discussion round with other people I've been talking to on my channel uh, that have been like um, for a longer time in the music industry or maybe even some younger ones, I don't know. But I feel like you could be a very good discussion partner. Would you be down for that in the future? Yeah, sure. Sure, Maybe talking about uh, the the future of the mi music industry. What? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Although I really have to say that I might not have the best perspective because I've most of the time have done stuff on my own. So. No, I think uh, that's even why yeah. you are a good one oh, in this team because I I know people. I thought the round that have like a different perspective and I feel like when it comes to search around it's important to have like different people in it unless it gets sure. boring. No. So totally down for that. Yeah. super, I'm happy to hear that. Then my um, nearly last question would be <laughs> um, to ask you when is there a new music coming out? Good question. I had the idea to like I had a single two, um, which went really well and I was planning on uh, doing another one in August. But um, since I want to use guest vocalists for a while, the guest vocals I actually wanted uh, kind of fell through. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm not sure there's going to be a single with guest vocals. That's the next thing. And I, I don't know how many of those I want to do, maybe four, five, something. Mm -hmm. and the original idea was to do one every two months. But um, I have enough songs, but I have to find the right vocalists that fit the song and are friends of mine and want to do it. Like, oh. I just asked one, and today I got the thing uh, back that they don't want to do it for whatever whatever reason, you know? Uh -huh. So um, 
it's not as easy as I in, initially thought it would be. Uh-huh. But that's if, the plan. If you need anything like vocalists and stuff, you can also hit me up, right? Because I do a lot of pitchings uh, to DJs, you know, vocals and everything. So if you need something, just contact me. I will definitely do that. Perfect. Then all we need to know is for the people watching, where can they find your music? Uh, everywhere. It's obviously on Spotify. Faderhead, just type in Faderhead, F-A-D-E-R-H-E-A-D. -E -E Same thing, Faderhead.com, uh, Facebook.com slash Faderhead, Instagram is different, Faderhead underscore official, because some dude has the, the Faderhead thing and he hasn't used it for 10 years or something. Yeah. Um, Twitter, it's Faderhead, it's Faderhead everywhere. Okay. Bandcamp. Faderhead, Bandcamp, whatever. Perfect, guys. <laughs> Then make sure to check his music out. It's totally dope. It, if it would be okay for you, I would also play some of your music after the stream. Of course. Of super, course. super happy to hear that. And then my absolute last question would be, do you have a motto for your fans? Do you have a quote or something you want to shout out? Ooh, I have so many. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Fuck it, we'll do it live. That's the quote. That's good. Love it. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Faderhead, for being my guest today. It was such a lovely Anya, conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, see you around. Talk to you soon. Absolutely. Have a good one today. Bye. Bye. Oh, what a pleasure. I really like uh, the vibe from him. Guys, we're going to listen a little to his music now. And um, yeah, if you want to support this channel, just... I don't know, follow me or something because I do this uh, three times a week at least. Um, I interview different people from the music industry. So, um, yeah. Also, if you know anybody who could be cool for an interview or you maybe yourself, um, like, hey, I want to be in the stream here, just hit me up on Instagram hard on the beat. And uh, yeah, unless I wish you a beautiful weekend. And thank you, The Real Straff Tanz. Uh, for the compliment. I'm happy that you were here today, guys. So let us check out his music. And then... I'm done for today. Okay, guys, enjoy your weekend. Let's listen to some music now and I'll see you latest next week on Tuesday. But maybe before. We'll see. Have a good one. Bye. <laughs>